Last week we did see that God reiterated his promise of the covenant that he had made with Abraham way back in chapter 15, and actually even before that to chapter 12. And in doing so, in the last chapter, he actually changed Abraham and Sarah's names. And, and this is very, it, it's, not, it's not unique to them because we see God changing other people's names as well. But in this particular instance, it's, it's very unique because there's this covenant that is coming alongside this name change. And so there's a lot of, a lot of meaning behind this name change. And we want to make sure we don't miss that. We also saw that, that God instituted the sign of the covenant, which is circumcision. And this is very important to the Jews. Abraham and his descendants would do this as a reminder of the covenant. And of course, guys, we, we're the winners on that one, right? So, so we have this covenant reminder here. And, and Abraham was very quick to be obedient, very quick to make that happen. And that's how chapter 17 ends. And so we're going to pick back up now in chapter 18, Genesis chapter 18, starting at verse 1. And so if you wouldn't mind standing for the reading of the Word of God, we're going to read together here. It says in verse 1, it says, Now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. When he lifted up his eyes... And looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves. After that, you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said, So do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, prepare three measures of fine flour, knead it, and make bread cakes. Abraham also ran to the herd and took a tender and choice calf and gave it to the servant, and he hurried to prepare it. He took curds and milk and the calf, which he had prepared, and placed it before them, and he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. Let's pray real quick. God, we are so grateful again for your word. We thank you for the blessing of being able to study and see who you are in the history of mankind. And this specific interaction that you have with Abraham, God, I'm I'm grateful for it that we can kind of see you in action as you are dealing with uh, Abraham and, and, and your servant. And we too can be your servants as well. And so God, I pray that you would interact with us in a meaningful way that we can know that you are not only giving us promises, but you're also giving us commands that we can serve you. And so Lord, I pray that you would bless this time together and be with everybody who couldn't join us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. All right, so you may have noticed, if you, were, uh, if you were here last week, you may have noticed that there's this, this idea of appearing, right? And in, in, in the last chapter, in chapter 17, God appeared to Abraham in a way that they were able to have a conversation. It was, a, it was a, kind of a, a prophetic meeting there uh, taking place between God and the prophet Abraham. And so he, they had a conversation, and, and the promise was reiterated, and the command was given, and then it says that he went back up from Abraham after that was all done, that, that interaction. And again, we don't really know what that looks like. But during this conversation that he had in, in the last chapter, Abraham is promised a son specifically from Sarah. We have this timeline here that shows that God is promising a, a son, and it's, and it's going to be through Sarah. It's not going to be Ishmael, who's the child of promise. And then we also have the sign of the covenant, which is circumcision. And I like how they have that knife right there. I'm like, okay, awesome, beautiful. And so that is the ending of chapter 17, right? So this covenant is given, or it's reiterated. And then we continue into... It goes into chapter 18, and we see this here. God appears with two angels and tells Abraham that Sarah will have a son. 
And you, and you might be thinking to yourself, this is, this is a little bit redundant, right? And we haven't really gotten into the story quite yet to see that promise being reiterated, but we're seeing a very similar instance taking place. And, and, and in chapter 17, God appeared to Abraham. And again, we don't know how that took place, but in chapter 18, he's appearing to Abraham in a way that he appears to be a man. And a lot of people look at this interaction and they're like, this is absolutely, number one, a theophany. But two, it's, for them, it's got to be a Christophany, right? Because he's appearing as a man. And, and for that, I come back and say, it can't be the same man that Christ was when he was on the earth. And the reason why is because the Bible says that he took on flesh. He took on the form of a servant and dwelt among us. And he was born as a baby, right? He grew up as a, per, a, a person, he grew up from a child to a man. And that is, that is taking place at this point thousands of years beforehand, right? And so this cannot be the same Christ body figure that we're seeing in the New Testament. It has to be different. And, and so as far as it being a Christophany is concerned, okay, I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily agree with that idea. It's not a deal breaker for me. I mean, you know, it's not heretical teaching. But it is, for, one, for sure, it is a theophany because we know that this is God presenting himself to Abraham uh, maybe in a similar instance as the quote-unquote angel of the Lord. Uh, that's up for debate. But, but God is now representing himself as a man. For, yeah, for those of you maybe who haven't heard that, that term before, uh, I have talked about it in the past, but maybe you've missed. So a theophany is basically a manifestation of God in a form that we can interact with, right? Like a... In, in, in Exodus, we see a burning bush, which we know is the angel of the Lord, uh, but we see a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud as he goes with them. We see this, this physical manifestation that Moses is actually capable of seeing his quote-unquote backside, whatever that may be or look like, but he, he has to hide his face from Moses because Moses would die if he saw his face. So there's all these, there's these manifestations of God where he can make himself visible and interactable. And in this particular case, this is absolutely a very great example of that, as we're going to see in just a second. Uh, Abraham was apparently capable of recognizing that this was God because he saw him and he uh, approached him from a very humble way, and I'll get into that in just a second. Uh, and, and so, uh, so Abraham is camped near the Oaks of Mamre by Hebron. So uh, this map is the one that we used back when we were talking about the war between the kings, but it has Mamre on here, and so that's why I kept uh, I'm using this map. And so that is where that is. And if you're familiar with the area, you'll know that Hebron is in basically that same area. And so that is where, uh, that's where Abraham has chosen to kind of settle. And you can also kind of see where Sodom and Gomorrah are in relation to that. And that will be important as we go through the chapter. All right, so let's, uh, let's take a look at what's taking place here. So Abraham is camped uh, near the Oaks of Mamre, near Hebron. He was at his tent door during the middle of the day. Now, as, uh, as people who live in Fresno or the Fresno area, the, the uh, Madera County, we understand what it means when it says the heat of the day, right? I mean, you can just think about that. I mean, we're, we're, we're in fall right now, which for us is really just winter, but because uh, we get two seasons, right? We get summer and winter, but we're, we're now getting relief from that heat. But during the heat of the day, what do you want to do? You want to sit there and just sweat, right? Because it's so hot. And back then they didn't have air conditioning, right? So what do you do in order to get some fresh air? You go to the door of the tent. Because if you're inside the tent, it's all hot and sweltery and yeah. So anyway, 
So you go to the door of the tent during the middle of the day. This was actually a tip, this, this was a typical for people, and there were times that you could you could rest in the shade of the door, but you're still getting the airflow. And it was also the time where they where they ate, and this actually in in those days was their primary meal of the day. They would eat other meals throughout the day, but this this meal was the most important meal. And this meal also was where they would actually, uh, Arabs and, and people during this day and this, this location, they would sit at their tent door and they would eat and they would wait for people to pass by. And as they did, they would say, come join me, eat. Very hospitable, right? This was a big deal back in those days. And so it was, this was a very common, common practice, what we're seeing Abraham do. Uh, Abraham, th- th- there is some interesting things taking place, though, and I'm going to point these out to you. Abraham saw these three men. He looked up, and there they are, right? They're just standing there. And he ran to them. This is very unusual. This is not something that a man of his status would be doing for anybody. Uh, in fact, usually in this case, when hospitality is being shown, Abraham would have stood up and beckoned for them to come to him. He would not leave where he was, and he would invite them to come and join, right? And if we know that it was someone who was of superior status, like say maybe it was a king, then Abraham would have walked forward a few steps and beckoned him to come and then touched him as they, he came into the threshold of the tent to welcome him in. That would have been something that he would have done for someone who was superior to him. But in this particular case, Abraham is running out to them. Very unusual and a little bit disgraceful for a man of his status to be running. Because if you remember... Uh, they would wear long robes because they didn't have pants, you know. They, they would have to, they would have to what, it's called girding up your loins. What they would do is they'd gather up their, their tunic or their robe or whatever and hold it in their midsection while they, would, while they would run. And so this is something that Abraham would have had to have done to get out to the Lord. And not only that, he bowed himself down to the ground. And again, that is something that servants do, not men of superior status. And so Abraham is recognizing who this person is, and he is acting accordingly, right? And hopefully, if we were greeted by the Lord in one case or another, we would have a similar reaction. I think we would have no choice in the matter. I think our reaction to that would be very similar to what we saw in the book of Revelation chapter 1, when the Apostle John uh, comes into contact with the risen Christ and he literally falls down on his face like a dead man. I have, a, I have an idea that that would probably be what would happen to us as well. But Abraham is, is doing this. He's recognizing that there is something special about at least one of these men. And so he extends his offer and hospitality. He is addressing the the one man in his speech, he's addressing the Lord in his speech, but he's using plural language to, to let them know that all three of them are welcome to come in. I think it's safe to say that uh, hospitality is a bit of a lost art compared to what we're seeing here, right? It's a little bit, little bit different than, than what you may have expected from a modern culture. But the Bible is very clear. The Bible is very clear that Christians are to show their love uh, for each other through practicing hospitality. There is a lot of instances in Scripture, both Old and New Testament, where hospitality is commanded and where we see that that we have um, specific instruction to represent the faith that we claim to believe, right? If, we, if, our, if our worldview and our faith is consistent with our actions, then hospitality should come naturally. We see in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9, the Apostle Peter is telling them, uh, his audience, to be hospitable to one another without complaint. And this is actually a verse that Brooke uses against me. 
because I'm like, I don't want to host. And she's like, don't complain. <laughs> because I am, I am much more of an introvert than she is. And so I have to be reminded that this is, this is charged to me as a Christian duty to be hospitable. Uh, of course, that's not all the time, just sometimes when I'm really tired. But that is the case. And so it is a good reminder, especially for, for people like me who maybe are not the most extroverted of, of individuals, that we need to make sure that we're practicing hospitality and doing so without complaint. Now we do have uh, another section here in Hebrews chapter 13. This is actually really important because it's actually referencing what we're seeing here in Genesis 18. This is what the author of Hebrews says. He says, let love of the brethren continue. Now, I want, you, I, I want you to keep that as your frame of reference. Let the love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember, the prisoners, as though in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated, since you yourselves also are in the body. And so this is, this is what hospitality looks like, that we are treating each other well and welcoming people in. And in, in this particular case, he's saying that some have entertained angels. But the idea here is that we are being hospitable to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Finally, there's a, another section that I'd like to read in Matthew chapter 25, and this is a fairly well-known story, so I'm not going to read the whole thing, but there is a, a particular section that I think is very, very important for us to read, and this is going to be addressing believers only. I'm not going to read the second half where it deals with the non-believers. I'm just going to read the first section. But in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is telling his disciples about what it's going to look like when he returns in glory. And it says this in verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, the king is Jesus, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them you did to me. Now, this is very important because, one, we're actually seeing something specific taking place. We're seeing hospitality take place in a number of different ways. But I want you guys to not miss this. It says in verse 40, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine. Who are the brothers? They're believers. They're members of the body of Christ. So this is not saying that we absolutely must open our homes to every single stranger that we ever meet, right? It doesn't mean that we must feed every single person we ever come into contact with. That's not what this is saying, right? Because I have some people say, well, this right here tells me that I need to be taking care of homeless people and welcoming them, in, welcoming them into my home and all this stuff. And then what we end up seeing is that these homeless people that they welcome in may not be the most savory of characters. And then they end up doing harm to these people. And they don't understand because they're just trying to fulfill the commandment. And what I want them to see is what he's talking specifically about is 
believers. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't take care of those who are in need. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm trying to show you is that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to love one another. And Jesus specifically says that is how the world will know we belong to him. They will know that we are Christians by our love for one another, right? That is what is being shown here. And so, I mean, we, I could get into further details in that. There's all kinds of different scriptures that talk about loving one another. And, and if we say that we love God but hate our brother, then we're a liar and all kinds of other stuff, right? But this is the idea of hospitality that I think we neglect sometimes, right? And this also is one of the reasons why I feel that as Christians, we ought to be meeting in each other's homes, we ought to be doing fellowship groups and welcoming each other in and being hospitable, but also being able to fellowship with one another. Because when we do these things, God is glorified in it. And not only that, it shows who we are in Christ. And it shows it to each, it, it shows it to each other, to believers. It also shows it to non-believers. Shows it to people who are outside of the faith. They can see how we treat one another. All right, let's, uh, let's continue forward here. Abraham is preparing far more than just bread for his guests, as he, has, as he promised. He brought everything to them and stood by them as they ate under the shade of a tree. Because again, it's not like he had a living room, right? He had a tent. And it's much better for them to eat under the shade of a tree than to go into the hot tent. So he's bringing everything out to them, and they ate. And I just want to throw this out there before we move forward. We recognize that this is a theophany. This is a representation of God, and we're going to have confirmation of that as we go through this. He's eating something. So it's not, he's not a spirit or a ghost or something like that who is intangible. No, this is a man eating food that was given to him, right? In fact, it's three of them. And we will see later on that it's the Lord as a theophany, as a, a physical representation in the form of a man, and two other men who are actually angels. They're capable of taking on flesh and bone, and they look and they act and they feel like men. And this is really, really important because... Back in the, in the early, early chapters, we see that uh, it talks about the sons of God having children by the daughters of men, and they're like, how is this possible? Well, we're, we're literally looking at evidence of angels having physical bodies, and if they're capable of eating, they're capable of doing everything else that a human body is capable of doing. So anyway, let's move forward here. We're, we're, we're going to be picking up at verse 9 in Genesis 18. It says this, then they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, There in the tent. Verse 10, He said, God, surely I, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing. Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son." Sarah denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. You can't pull the wool over God, on God, right? That, you can't trick him, you can't lie to him. He knows everything. So you might as well just be honest. But she was afraid, and so she denied it. 
and, and it's actually funny because uh, I talked to Brooke about this too. I, uh, that, that seems to be my lifelong habit as well. When I get afraid, I, I hide, I lie or whatever. And so that's, um, that, uh, I think that's just human nature, right? We don't want to be caught in doing something that we have done. And, and so I, I can relate to Sarah. But as we have seen before, here now is a question asked, which, which the answer is already known. And we see them asking, where is Sarah, right? This is God we're talking about. He knows where Sarah is. He doesn't need to ask where she is. He's asking intentionally. This is the same interaction that we see a couple chapters ago with Hagar. If you guys remember, we saw the story of Hagar, and she's out at a well or a spring, and the angel of the Lord meets her there, and he asks her questions to which he already knows the answers to. But he asks anyway, and the reason why he does this is because he's interacting with us in a way that we can understand. It would be extremely unusual for us to be confronted with the God of the universe, and he just begins telling us everything that's going on. That would be like, I, I'm overwhelmed, right? Like, I can't, I can't even process what's happening right here. This, this interaction is, is it's too much, right? But he's able to interact with him and with, with Hagar in a way that reveals who he is because he knows things that he should not know. In Hagar's uh, example, he identifies her by name and identifies her also by her occupation, that she's Sarah's, Sarai, Sarai's maidservant. In this particular case, Abraham is asked, where is his wife? Obviously, well, she's back in the tent, right? I mean, that's where, that's where she belongs, right? Barefoot in the kitchen? No, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, but that's, where, that's where they would be, right? That's where, the, that's where the wife of the household would be, would be in the tent, taking care of business. For one, it's kind of a silly question, but two, how did he know her name? I don't know. doesn't say, except for that maybe he's God, and he would know this. We see this again after this questioning is taking place. God immediately goes into reaffirming this promise of a son through Sarah. And I actually think that this was intentional. I actually think that this was intentional. I think he made this promise out loud within earshot of Sarah on purpose. And it seems now that this meeting was meant more for Sarah than it was for Abraham. I think that we're going to see as this continues forward, Abraham will continue in his interaction with God. But I think that this particular meeting and the way that things went in this regard was more for Sarah's sake. Remember, the promise was already given to Abraham. This was not new to him. In fact, he had just suffered physical infliction when this was given. And so I think that's going to be pretty memorable, right? I wouldn't forget it. And so he is now reiterating this promise that was given to him, and Sarah reacts. And it seems a little bit at first blush to be similar to Abraham's reaction in chapter 17. But in fact, it was not. Scripture tells us that Abraham never doubted. He just was like in awe of what was being promised. But in this particular case, Sarah here does doubt in her heart. And she was, at minimum, 89 years old. Scripture actually says she's closer to 90. She's identified as 90. It's probably somewhere in that regard. Uh, because she actually had Isaac when she was 90 also. So there's this, maybe she just had a birthday. I don't know. I don't want to mince words. But at minimum, she's 89 years old. God, knowing all, the, all this, and she, he knows all the things in the hearts of men, he perceives Sarah's laughter and doubt. And if there was ever any question as to who this was, now there should be no mistake. In fact, there's a, a, a section in 1 Kings chapter 8 that is, they're discussing who God is, and this is what it says. Then hear in heaven your dwelling place, and forgive, and act, and render to each according to all his ways, whose heart you know 
For you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men. And there's some interaction taking place here that we just don't have time to get into. But I want you guys to catch this. He is, he is in heaven, and yet he is hearing everything. And he's also able to forgive, and he's able to act and render to each according to the ways of all men. And why is he capable of doing this? Because he knows the hearts of men. And he knows what is in their thoughts and what they do. And so then the Lord asks a very important question of Abraham and Sarah. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? And we've got some scripture that talks about this in Job chapter 42. Job is talking to God and he says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Again, in Mark chapter 10, we see Jesus talking, and he looks at his disciples, and he speaks with them, and in this particular case, he says, with people it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. We believe in a God that is omnipotent, and that is a Christianese word that essentially means he is all-powerful. There is nothing he cannot do based on strength alone. Now, just to dive a little bit into the apologetic aspect of this, there are certain things that God cannot do. He cannot lie. He cannot sin. He cannot do something that's contrary to his nature or his character. He also cannot contradict the laws of nature in a sense that he can't make a square circle, right? Because it is a logical fallacy to do something along those lines. Can he do it in the spiritual sense of being able to do whatever he wants? He absolutely can. And if he had created a reality where there was such a thing as square circles, he could absolutely do that. But he didn't. He chose not to. And so in the reality that we exist in, he can't do a logical contradiction in that sense. But it's not because he's limited. It's because he's interacting with his creation in a way that we are capable of understanding. And he cannot change, then that is part of his nature. We don't want a God who can change. We don't want a God who is, uh, is capable of breaking his own nature. Because if that was the case, then we could not trust him. If that was the case, then he could lie to us and change his mind and then say, nope, I take it back. He could decide one day that the, the sacrifice that Christ made for us was now insufficient. And now you have to do something else for salvation. That would be atrocious. That would be horrible for us. And so we really don't want to be worshiping a God who can change. But in the sense that he can do anything, absolutely. He is quite capable. Quite capable. Nothing is impossible with him. Now we do see that this interaction that God has with Sarah is a little bit of a rebuke. It's gentle. He's not chastising her or anything. But this actually leads her to having faith. And actually we see in Hebrews chapter 11 in that hall of faith and that we've looked at previously when we were talking about Abraham. We see in verse 11 it says, By faith even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. She believed, she had faith in the promise, and thus she was able to conceive. We must remember that all things are possible with God. And not only must we remember this, we must live accordingly. Church, I can't tell you how many times I talk to people who are living in defeat because their lack of faith is, is concealing what God is doing for them in their lives. 
I want to encourage each and every one of you today to live as if God is capable of anything. And I challenge you to live that way. Because it is a challenge. It, it sometimes steps outside of our normal pattern of living. But if God is capable of anything, then he is capable of rectifying any problem in your life. He is also capable of bringing you through those problems and using them for his glory. And in fact, he is capable of making the outcome better for you if that problem had never happened in the first place. I mean, you know, it could be, it could be an illness or an injury, a car accident, a loss of a job, maybe even the breakdown of a marriage. God can use anything, no matter how tragic, one, for his glory, and two, for your good. And I mean, you, I understand some people, if they're suffering, if they're undergoing trauma, they're not able to see that, they're thinking maybe this is insensitive. How could you say that? How could you say that God could use this for good? Because I have seen story after story after story of people who have experienced trauma and loss and pain and come out of it 10, 20 years later, and they're better for it. I personally have experienced trauma and loss. And I now can look back on the path that God had set before me, and I have seen his hand moving in my life. And maybe one day I'll share my story with you guys. But the thing about it is, is that God is in control. And he will not allow something to happen to you that he has not ordained. He has not allowed. And the most dramatic story that we can see is actually in scripture with the story of Job. Job loses everything. Except for the one thing he wants to lose, which is his wife. Which, I'm just, just kidding, but... I mean, in a sense, if you see the interaction, you'll understand what I'm saying. But he loses everything. He loses all of his kids. He loses all of his possessions. He loses his health, everything. And yet God is capable of restoring every single one of those things to him and doubling it. God is capable of doing everything. All things are possible with God. Now let's move forward here. We see this interaction taking place between God and Abraham and Sarah, and now picking up back up at verse 16. Then the men rose up from there and looked down towards Sodom. And Abraham was walking with them to send them off. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed? For I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry which has come to me. And if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom, while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. Now, before we get into their interaction, because it is a very interesting interaction. This is what I was talking about earlier, this interaction that's about to take place. But before we get to that point, I want to point out that we are seeing a relationship between God and Abraham. And I was just talking to someone this week about quote-unquote religion. And, and this is what religion looks like, right? And what I would like to point out and the argument I'd like to make before you today is that this is not religion we are talking about here. This is not religion what we're seeing here. This is relationship. And this is what it's all about. This is what we are to have with God. Maybe not in the same sense. Maybe we'll never have an interaction with God in the same way that Abraham does 
where we have a theophany before us and we're having a face-to-face -face conversation, so to speak, with God Almighty. And maybe we're never promised things that Abraham has promised, but we can still have relationship with God. You can still pray to your Father who is in heaven, who can hear you. And he can answer your prayers. You can learn about him through the studying of his word, through observing his qualities and attributes in nature and in the people around us, because we are made in his image. We can learn about him and grow closer to him by recognizing who he is and how much he loves us. Because when we see in his word, we see his interactions, we see that he died for us on the cross. Then there's no greater love than that. And that would just draw us closer to the God who is willing to give it all up for us. And so we see this relationship playing out. And this time, God is revealing plans to his prophet which is not unusual as prophets go. God does this to his prophets all the time, that he reveals things that are about to take place in the future. But I want you guys to check out what he's saying to him in this process of revealing his plans to him. He again reiterates the promise that was given back in chapter 12. He's blessed to be a blessing, right? He's to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. And then he gives specifications of his relationship with Abraham. God first chose Abraham just as he chose us even before the world began. We see this in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Starting at verse 6, it says this, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples for you were the fewest of all peoples. And then it continues on. But he's declaring that God chose Israel. God chose Israel the ancestors of Israel, which goes all the way back to Abraham. And he chose us as well. We see this in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, where, he, where we see that he chose us specifically in a New Testament sense. It says, and in, in starting in verse 4, he's, we're, we're starting halfway through a, a, a thought here, but he says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. And that can continue forward, but I want you guys to pick up on this. One, he chose us before the foundation of the world for something. Just as he chose Abraham for something, he chose us for something. And what is it that he chose us for? The exact same thing. That we would be holy and blameless before him. And that's ex almost exactly what he said to Abraham. So that he would command his family and his descendants to do righteousness and justice. Right? That's what he's chosen for. And in the same sense, it continues by saying that in love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. He's predestined us to adoption. We're adopted into the family. And again, going back and looking at his promise to Abraham, he says that he may bring upon Abraham what he had spoken about him. And what was that? It was a promise of a son. It was a promise of land. It was a promise that his descendants would dwell in the land. Children, adoption as sons. It's a beautiful thing to see the consistency of Scripture as this goes on. Abraham was chosen so that he would instruct his descendants on keeping the way of the Lord, doing righteousness and justice. One of my all-time favorite Bible verses, Micah 6, 8. 
He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. That is what Abraham did in his life. And it's what God wanted him to command to his descendants as well. And it was in this case so that Abraham would be a blessing and God would then bless Abraham. Now, Brooke actually asked me, does this mean that Abraham's blessing was contingent upon his actions? And the answer to that is no, otherwise his choosing would have been after Abraham's faithfulness. Because remember, Abraham was chosen before. So Abraham's performance was, uh, was not what was, what was granting his choosing. So let's, let's move forward here because I'm already running out of time. God reveals his plan to Abraham, namely that he is about to punish Sodom and Gomorrah with destruction. We see that God is just and we see why the destruction is going to take place. This is the, in, the interesting interaction with Abraham that we're about to see. It's very unique in Scripture. And the reason why is because it is taking, it's taking place within the reality of our time. So I'm going to read this to you guys, and I want you to think about the fact that God is outside of time. And he already knows everything that's taken place. He already knows who's guilty of what. He already knows that the sin is just as bad as he is claiming it to be, as far as the outcry. And yet, let's take a look at this. Genesis chapter 18, picking back up at verse 23. Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare the whole place on their account. And Abraham replied, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes. Suppose the fifty righteous are lacking five. Will you destroy the whole city because of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. He spoke to him yet again, saying, Suppose forty are found there. And he said, I will not do it on account of the forty. Then he said, Oh, may the Lord not be angry, and I shall speak. Suppose thirty are found. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the twenty. Then he said, Oh, may the Lord not be angry, and I shall speak only this once. Suppose ten are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the ten. As soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed, and Abraham returned to his place. This is an extremely interesting interaction, and I wish we had more time to get into this, because we are seeing bargaining taking place with God. That's what we're seeing taking place here. Abraham is risking to bargain with the creator of heaven and the earth. And he knows this. He knows this. He even says to him, I am but dust and ashes, but I'm venturing to speak to the Lord, and he's doing it for the sake of righteous people. I want you guys to catch that. He's doing this for the sake of righteous people. He does not want the righteous to be destroyed with the wicked. That is the heart behind Abraham doing this. Now, of course, Abraham certainly would have known that his nephew Lot was in danger at this point. But in, essentially, Abraham is, is interceding on behalf of any righteous people who would be dwelling in that region, appealing to the justice and the righteousness of God. I had a, a, a verse that I was going to read to you guys, but I'm going to skip it for the sake of time. But feel free to go and read Psalm chapter 11, verses 4 through 7. 
It's, it's very interesting to read that. It talks about him knowing the, who are righteous and who are wicked and, and uh, him judging those who are wicked. But we must know that while Abraham is doing this and he's bargaining, God knows who is in Sodom and Gomorrah. He knows their state of mind and their, and their wickedness and whatever else you might call it. He knows what's going on. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 5, I'm going to read this very quickly. He's talking to the, the prophet Jeremiah. He says this, Roam to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and look now and take note and seek in her open squares if you can find a man, if there is one who does justice, who seeks truth, then I will pardon her, the city. And although they say, as the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. O oh Lord, do not your eyes look for truth. You have smitten them, but they do not weaken. You have consumed them, but they refuse to take correction. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to repent. This is the state at which we find God's judgment taking place when people's hearts are hardened to God and they refuse to repent. In spite of this, though, God humors Abraham and goes along with his bargaining. I just think it's very humorous to me. Abraham recognizes who he's pleading, uh, that who he's pleading for is a lost cause, Sodom and Gomorrah. And so he, he feels the need to shamelessly and continually lower the bar, right? It'd be like, okay, Vegas. I'm sure we can find 50 righteous people in Vegas. And then it's like, well, maybe 45. Maybe better go with 40, 30. You know, the same thing, right? That's what's taking place here. And God acquiesces to every request, fully knowing what is about to take place fully knowing what is going to happen with Sodom and Gomorrah. And we are going to see what takes place in the next chapter next week. But we're out of time, so let's, uh, let's conclude our time together with some review of application. First, I'd like to remind everybody that Christians are to show their love for one another through the practicing of hospitality. I, I really can't stress this enough, church. We need to love one another. It is how the world knows that we are Christians. This doesn't mean that we put ourselves first. That means we put ourselves last compared to our brothers and sisters. We need to take care of one each other. We need to meet each other's needs. That is how people will know we are Christians. And finally, we must remember that all things are possible with God. And also, in doing so, we must live accordingly. If he is God and I am not, why do I continually take the throne from him? That is a good question we should all be asking ourselves. If he is God and I am not, why do I think I'm in control? Right? Because we're not. But we want to be, and we fight for it, and we claw for it. And really, we're just doing damage. We need to live according to this idea that God is capable of doing all things. He is in control. Now, next week, we will continue the story that we're seeing here with Sodom and Gomorrah and these, these angels, these men who are going to walk into it. It's, it's a fascinating story. It's an unfortunate story, but it is quite fascinating. But if, uh, if you have now come to the realization that God is God and you are not, and you have not submitted yourself to the God of Abraham, to the God of creation, there's no better time to do that than right now. We, we need to make sure that we are submitting ourselves to the God who's revealed himself to us in Scripture because he is ultimately in control of our lives and our destinies, our eternal destinies. And so if we want to be in right standing with God, if we want to have a relationship with God, we need to first submit ourselves to him.